Before we start today's show, we want to invite you to stick around at the end of the episode to enjoy a preview of a new podcast that premieres on July 14th. As the industry's exclusive cannabis podcast network, MJ Bulls is proud to present Women Leading in Cannabis. Join host Kira Reed each week for inspirational discussions with women who are leading the cannabis industry. Welcome to today's Hemp Barons podcast, everyone. I'm host Joy Beckerman, and we have a great show for you today. I do want to take a moment to address what's happening around the country right now and in other parts of the world. As we know, on May 25th, George Floyd, an African-American man, was killed in Minneapolis. He was handcuffed, and while lying face down, Derek Chauvin, a white police officer, knelt on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. And according to the criminal complaint that was filed against Chauvin, that was two minutes and 53 seconds after Floyd was unresponsive. This happened, of course, while three other officers who participated in Floyd's arrest were standing by. One was holding his back while this murder was taking place, the other holding his legs. And the third officer stood nearby, keeping citizens from preventing Floyd's death as they literally shouted, you're killing him. Now, as of the taping of this weekly address uh, thus far, due to massive public outcry, authorities finally arrested Chauvin on May 29th, Friday, and charged him with third degree murder. But despite ongoing and growing public outcry, the other three officers have still not been arrested or charged. And I hope by the airing of this show, that news will have changed. There have been peaceful protests across the nation that have been infiltrated by a variety of interests and they've caused property damage, theft, fires, injury to others, both innocent citizens and police officers. Those invaders range from white supremacists to anarchists to, according to some reports, the police themselves, because riots give rise to the potential use of force. Now, sitting down en masse in the middle of a city street is an outstanding and nonviolent way to protest. It shuts down traffic and commerce. It forces governments to respond. And the organizers of peaceful, permitted protests taking place all over are aware of all of those nonviolent methods. Protesters are not rioters. Both of these things are taking place, and we need to know the difference and understand the dynamics of what's happening. But the bottom line is, it's not enough to be non-racist. We have to be vocally anti-racist. It's our responsibility to use our power to engage in the process and for the love of all that is good and right in this world. It is our responsibility for those of us who are white to use our white privilege with all of our might to speak up for what is good and just and compassionate in our neighborhoods in the stores and the eateries that we frequent during meetings, at schools, and at work, because no one is free until we are all free. And with that, I'll discuss the fact that Minneapolis is in Hennepin County. And guess what? Hennep is Dutch for hemp. And when we talk about the history that hemp has in our country, we can even discuss Geographical names like Hempstead, Long Island, Hempstead County, Arkansas, Hempstead, Texas, Hemp Hill, North Carolina, and Hempfield, Pennsylvania. So in Hennepin County, Minneapolis, revolution is taking place, just as the hemp revolution is taking place across the United States, giving us hope, creating jobs, and stimulating the economy, and helping us find alternative and better ways to make regenerative products and to regenerate our communities. And so today, I'm very happy uh, to be able to deliver to you a fantastic interview with Patrick Atagi, Chairman of the Board of the National Industrial Hemp Council. Uh, Patrick is a third-generation specialty crop farmer who has integrated hemp into his rotations. Most importantly, on top of his acumen for uh, agronomy and farming and agricultural scheme in the United States, he is deeply experienced, as is the entire board of the National Industrial Hemp Council. Patrick served as Deputy Director for Intergovernmental Affairs for the United States Department of Agriculture during the George W. Bush, Bush administration. He's an experienced executive with a demonstrated history of working in the government relations industry, and he served as legislative assistant under U.S. Senator Mark Hatfield, who was then the chairman of the U.S. Senate Appropriations Committee. Patrick and their board are bringing a whole new perspective and focusing very much on a checkoff program that we'll go into and educate uh, folks about as this interview unfolds. 
Thank you so much for listening, everybody. Get ready for a great interview, and I hope you have a healthy and inspired week. Remember, use your power. Well, welcome, Patrick. Thank you so much for being with us on Hemp Barons today. And thank you for having me on board. Very much appreciated, Joy. Mm, such a pleasure. You know, we're seeing various trade associations pop up with this incredible new opportunity in hemp. And so it's really a breath of fresh air to see the National Industrial Hemp Council with the tremendous amount of agricultural experience, advocacy experience, trade association, and and huge industry experience. In fact, you are not only a farmer who is also farming hemp um, and a third generation one at that, from what I understand, uh, but also head of government government affairs for NWP CA, the National Wooden Pallet um, Container Association, and a, and a tremendous background. Could you just give us a little bit about your background and then what brought you into hemp or when hemp got on your radar, Patrick? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. I would say, you know, hemp has been on my radar for more than 30 years, to be honest with you. When I was working for my senator, Mark Hatfield, from Oregon um, back in the early 1990s, um, and he was chair of the Senate, United States Senate Appropriations Committee. And I saw the, you know, language come across my desk of trying to get hemp legalized back then. And as you know, you know, it was an uphill battle, you know, with North Dakota senators putting in a language. And I saw, you know, that come across my desk. So, you know, I've been following with interest for quite a while. Um, and you, I grew up on a family farm out in eastern Oregon, about 50 miles from Boise, Idaho. Uh, so I would always say that uh, I'm a farm hand, but not a farmer. I'm always very clear to point that out. Um, I'm a farm owner now um, through, you know, my family. Um, but when it became legal um, to grow hemp, there's obviously a great interest. And that's kind of how the NIHC, the National Industrial Hemp Council, was formed, um, was there's a lot of interest in the area uh, where I'm from and across the country. Uh, so that's kind of the the quick and uh, quick background of how we got to where we are. But you know, I've been following it. I've always had a you know tremendous belief in, you know, hemp as a product and you know, understand the background behind it, but you know, it's it's just really a phenomenal plant, as you well as you really well know, and uh, you know, singing to the choir. But that's how I how I got, you know, involved and how the association really got started from the from the bootstraps up. I have been so, this is wonderful for me to realize. I don't think, and if, if when we've spoken before this, I don't think we addressed it because this is fantastic. 30 years, you have, this plant has been in your field of awareness for 30 years, basically as long as it's been in mine and, and many, many industry leaders. I love hearing this and knowing about this. So, because you probably know just as well as I do, um, that once you get bit by the hemp bug, that's it. It's up in your DNA and you just can't shake it. And clearly you weren't able to shake it. This is a, a tremendous benefit to the rest of us that you were bit by the hemp bug so very long ago. No, absolutely. It's, you know, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful crop. You know, I guess I come in from the farm background is we need as many arrows in the quiver of our, you know, production that we can. Um, you know, my background and family, uh, we did well with, you know, it sounds funny when I hear about it, when I hear myself say it, but with onions and specialty crops, my background's in that, uh, very much in that field, especially crops. Um, you know, when you discover a crop, uh, you know, you can make a lot of money on it, but then the farmers around you who might be a little hesitant to enter into the fray look and go, in our case, well, those Japanese American farmers are, they're doing pretty good raising onions. Um, you know, then they start raising it and then the field gets very crowded and prices drop. And then, you know, you get into the, well, what else can I grow? And, you know, then you're, you're a business owner. You have to decide what are you going to plant? What are the markets? You know, it's a very, it's a very challenging, you know, business being a farmer. You have to have wear so many hats. So, you know, hemp is, you know, is, is another one of those, you know, that, that popped up and that we really, you know, as, as you know, it's a really joy. It's a really wonderful, wonderful crop product. You know, uh, major companies are looking at it, you know, in terms of beyond CBD. I know that's where, you know, the money is, but in terms of fiber, you know, it's just, it's just really wonderful, durable, you know, product. So, so that's where the National Industry Hemp Council is really focusing on is more that long-term vision, which we started, you know, 
um, when we formed uh, that we really need to open up the markets in many, many areas, you know, um, uh, including CBD and beyond. Yes, and, and so grateful for CBD, as I, as I often say, even though, even when you say we're not going to talk about CBD in this seminar or this meeting or this conference, it still takes up all the air in the room and you still end up talking about it. And and so grateful that so many folks are learning about the true promise and potential and on these trillion dollar industries of oil, seed and fiber that that hemp serves through CBD. But uh, clearly you and I came to it um, from the oil, seed and fiber, which, which again, I can't say it enough, are the true uh, trillion dollar industries. And and before we get too much into it, I really want to highlight some of the just, again, tremendous talent on the NIHC board. Um, would you mind telling us a little bit about some of your stars? And we could do a whole hour just on your board members, by the way. And uh, But some highlights of that really uh, powerful board that, that has been uh, put together for the NIHC. Yeah, and absolutely. And I'll, and I'll plant a seed and your head joy and Dan is to bring on John Johnson um, on for a discussion. Cause I think there really could be a 45 minute hour discussion with John. John uh, recently joined our board. Of, yeah. John recently joined our board of directors. He's with the national pork producers council. He's also the chief financial officer for the pork um, checkoff. Ooh. And, you know, I've talked, yeah, I've talked with several folks and this is really a, great way to kind of start spreading the message we're talking you know with some other groups about you know pursuing a checkoff program but for those listeners who aren't familiar with it if you think about got milk that's a checkoff program where you know, producers do a self-assessment um you know rising tide raises all boats that money goes into marketing uh for the industry for you know farmers and for the the crop you know the case of milk for dairy and that money is collected and goes into uh, for a marketing campaign. So John uh, is also has his his son is involved in the hemp industry. So he had a real personal interest uh, with the National Industry Hemp Council, and I've known him for you know decades. Um, really phenomenal person, and as you noted, a phenomenal background. And he and him and and one of our vice presidents on marketing and trade, Kevin Latner. Um, he's not on our board, but he's on staff, uh, really have a good knowledge of the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the checkoff programs. You know, to get a checkoff program, the steps are fairly easy, but getting there is very complicated because of the makeup of the board and the outreach and the vote to do that. But John, you know, really has a, a phenomenal background uh, in that. So that's, you know, really his strong point and, you know, why he came on board to help shepherd this, you know, a checkoff program, which will take you know, it takes a while to get it done. You know, there's a lot of moving parts and pieces, but, you know, he's put this together before and knows the pitfalls, you know, the, and again, you know, the makeup of the board, you know, it has to be broad. You know, it's not one association that can do that. What a con. Yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I, I'm so sorry to sit there and interrupt. It's just what a contribution. Many, you know, we've all been talking about checkoff programs, understanding very well, and, and certainly as I'm sure you're aware, the Canadian Hemp Trade Alliance successfully yeah. created a checkoff up there. Of course, they had 20 years on us, 1998, they federally began to regulate that promising crop with federal crop insurance. So uh, what a contribution that is going to be to these emerging hemp, uh, hemp economy, The all of the opportunities, just that's fantastic. I wondered, just because we only recently became aware of it, I guess it was announced um, in late April, but I just found out about it literally this week, um, that the Montana hemp growers, and it was announced through the Montana Department of Agriculture, that the Montana hemp growers established a 1% checkoff. I don't know if you were aware of that. I wasn't aware of that specifically but I've heard others um, working on that or doing self-assessment. You know, that's really, really helpful because, you know, that goes towards a national checkoff, you know, hopefully is where we get to. And, you know, with the State Departments of Agriculture is very important, as I was talking with other folks. The National Association of State Departments of Agriculture, NASDA, um, I actually worked there for several years. I think it would be a very powerful ally in this and, you know, seek others to um, chat with them and, you know, and their staff and um, their CEO about it. We have a few uh, State Department of Agriculture Secretary Commissioners and Directors of Agriculture as members. So that's a path forward that we're looking at. Um, you know, in terms of implementation, 
you know, they're set up perfectly to um, administer a checkoff program. So we're, so we're doing some initial conversations. And, you know, again, this is everybody needs to be on board. It's not a one person or one organization. It's really a has to be a group effort. And that's the complication of a checkoff is to get everybody to agree. Um, but I think, you know, there's, there's incentive. Yeah, there's incentive, though, for NAS. I mean, they're a regulator, but, you know, they, they promote farming, but they're also a regulator and regulating agency, and they have the information because um, a lot of the checkoff, you know, work is doing is promotion of the checkoff and letting people know about it. You know, as you noted, you know, you're learning about it. Others are learning about it. Um, and it's, it's, you know, something that you have to kind of get a grasp of, that it is a self-assessment. Um, you know, other checkoffs have not, you know, been established in the, and you, you mentioned fiber in the forest and fiber, you know, world, they tried a, a lumber checkoff uh, and, that, and that didn't go through, but that was a more well-established long-term, a lot of history, you know, between the members um, where the big members were, well, why did I pay, you know, marketing for my competitor? And that's just an education of, you know, a rising tide raises all boats in the lumber industry. Now, if they had a checkoff boat, would pass. It didn't pass, I think it was two years ago. Uh, but now they would just because of the, you know, logging in China and getting their logs out. So it's a, it, it, you have to do it right. Um, but I'm planting the seed, you know, with, with you, Joy, and others um, to start thinking about it. It's an 18 to 21, 24 month process. Could be faster, could be longer. It's just a matter of outreach and vote. Uh, but you talked about the stars on our on our board. Uh, one of those is another one of those is Undersecretary Bill Hawk, former Undersecretary at U.S. Department of Agriculture, Agricultural Marketing Service. So you know his knowledge obviously is 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 pretty good because that program was under him, right? Just absolutely um, huge. And then, have, and then we have John Johnson. Yeah, absolutely. And we have career level. So from the top down, you know we're capable of doing it, but. You know, that's staff directed, you know, association directed. And so, um, you know, putting the feelers out there and, you know, those listening, um, you know, look into a checkoff and see if there's an interest. Because at the end of the day, you know, we can get it done um, in terms of the administrative part of it. But really, the, the industry has to ask for it. Absolutely. And and two things on that. One, you know, as, as vice president of federal lobbying for the U.S. Hemp Roundtable, I want to talk about getting in on that. Um, and, and hopefully sure. um, you're working with uh, or at least are in communication with the U.S. Hemp Growers Association. Yes or no on that, if you're able to say. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We're yeah, we have conversations. I chat with Karen periodically. I think we've uh, you know, we're we're she's starting her organization and we're building ours, but yeah, we definitely, we talk with each other and, um, yeah, we, we chat, yeah, we chat, we chat with all the folks. We probably should be better about doing more to be honest with you, Joy. We're just, uh, you know, we're also focused on trying to get things done that, you know, we need to stop and take time to say hello, uh, but I saw Karen at the Organic Trade Association brother, meeting. I am, and, uh, I am <laughs> brother, I am acutely aware. It's not like it's a, a widget. It's not like it's a plant that has one purpose. I mean, where does one start? You know, I, I recently uh, resigned from board service from the Hemp Industries Association, but it's just, there is just a never ending need, right? I mean, we're talking about human right. and animal nutrition, body care, nutraceuticals, pharmaceuticals, uh, paper, textiles, biocomp it's building materials, I'm going to keep going, industrial sealants and coating, supercapacitors, fuel, energy, nanotechnology, oh my God, stop me. Um, yes, right. it's hard to come up for air and reach out to each other, but we know how important this checkoff program is because occasionally as we are able to like stop trading water and just lift our chins up a little bit, we say check off and then we go back down into the water and keep treading, you know. Right. Um, and on that, I'm on that, on, Patrick, <laughs> <laughs> on that, Patrick, can you tell the listeners the purpose of a checkoff program and what it does? Why why a checkoff program? Well, a checkoff program, first off, it's a generic promotion of the commodity um, like milk. You can't say dairy gold. You can't say specific names. Uh, you know, but it's a very broad, general marketing program to make people aware and to promote the product, um, you know, uh, you know, the look and feel of cotton, 
right? USA Cotton. Um, it promotes the products that people are wearing. You know, and I think it, it brings the industry together in a unified voice. Where's and I think in general, I think that is, where's the beef? exactly where's the beef? Absolutely. Um, you know, that was uh, that that was a Wendy's campaign, but a good campaign. Um, but it's 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 you know it's paired, right? So we're working, you know, with USDA on international. We're working on two fronts: on an international front and on a domestic front. So the domestic front is the generic making people aware, and it's not just CBD, right? We talked about that before, and you listed you know far more products than I ever could in five seconds <laughs> than I could in, in in twenty minutes. But that's the point of just saying, you know, how wonderful hemp. You know, however that promotion is, and um, you know, and that is that is many things, so that we get the the product established, and that's my greatest fear, is that it will get a bad name. Something will happen. Maybe not even directly, you know, with, um, you know, CBD. Some people, you know, you could take. There, I've heard of instances where, you know, somebody's taking um, uh, olive oil and then putting in serotonin to get that effect of, you know, being sleepy, right? So let's say somebody's allergic to serotonin. And I'm just, this is an example. It's not a real, it's not a real, something that's happened, but it's my fear. Um, and then what's going to be the news story, right? It's going to be an attack on CBD when in fact it had nothing to do with CBD, when hemp has been around, you know, for decades, you know, centuries, as you know. Um, you know, but, but it's going to be a great news story, right? And then mm -hmm. somebody's going to go, oh, you know, you have, textiles or fabric or filler in a coat, you know, when they, somebody's like, oh, I, you can, I can get high from this. Some sort of, you know, underground, you know, Reddit feed gets out of saying, oh, you can get high from wearing a hemp, hemp coat, you know, you know, and that's, and that's ludicrous. But, you know, in today's world, how something can catch hold um, and get out there. So, you know, I really think, you know, it just needs to be established as such as C yeah. such as CBD infused masks can help with COVID. Those types of things. I, I had to. I had yeah. to. Sorry. Well, sure. I mean, we'll switch gears a little bit, and we were talking about the board, but you know, folks can come to the National Industrial Hemp Council, hempindustrial.com, and look at our board makeup. And you know, we, you know, we may be you know a new organization, but our depth goes you know decades, if not centuries, of you know background you know in this world in Washington D.C. and at the farmer level, you know, our, our folks are farmers, um, you know, um, who have farmed and, uh, you know, still farm, some of them. So but let's switch gears. You know, that, it was interesting you mentioned the, the CBD and the mask. And, you know, I'll start off with saying, you know, CBD, does, you know, won't uh, kill COVID. You know, that's, that's not the way it works. But we had an interesting meeting uh, with our, our task force, our Food and Drug Administration task force. We had a presenter. And uh, it was um, Jay Noller with Oregon State University's um, uh, Hemp Innovation Center, International Hemp Innovation Center at Oregon literally, State University. I literally just, we, we just did another podcast interview and I had to talk about the rock star who is Dr. Jay Noller. I'm such a fan. He's a wonderful did, man. Did you, talk, did you talk with him? No, I, I will eventually get to, we, you know, I, I've helped teach a course on hemp at OSU. I, I lived in Seattle for, so I've known Jay for, for quite some number of years now and, and, and I'm just such a fan, but I've not had him on the show yet, but I certainly will. I want to hear what, what so, Jay Noller's story you yeah, have so to this, tell. So this is another hour long, I mean, many, many hour, this is a series um, that, you need, that you need to talk with Jay about. But so in the system, in the human system, and he explains it better than I, um, is that there's a cannabinoid system in our system. It's actually called that. Um, and that, and, and one of those pieces... The, the endo, the endocannabinoid system. Endocannabinoid, thank you. Is that, it, that one of the things it does is our temperature has a, has a control tower, you know, like an airport, you've got a control tower. And the person in the control tower in our body regulates the temperature and how our body fights um, disease, viruses, Etc. Right, it raises the temperature and you know helps helps kill whatever's inside of you. But when under stress, that can go haywire. And again, I'm far oversimplifying. You know what what Jay was talking about. Um, but CBD can help uh, fix that when it goes haywire. 
right? So it helps us regulate the temperature and can help our body fight disease, um, not directly, you know, by killing what's in it, but helping our, our, our system um, combat what's, what's ailing us uh, internally. And again, this is a, you know, this is a 30,000, 50,000 foot level really would um, really, you know, emphasize that you really need to get Jay on and talk about it. Cause there's been research done. It's just, yes. Well, we just had it. I mean, and Jay is incredible, brilliant, but yes, we just yeah. literally just did uh, Dr. Yakubis Zaverkus. So the homeostatic regulatory yeah. system, yeah. Yeah. homeostasis. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. But you know, what's yeah. beautiful, yeah. Patrick, is that the way you just explained it though, um, there are many listeners, they're going to understand it uh, the way you just explained it. So thank you so much for that 30,000 foot uh, <laughs> view of it, because it's actually quite helpful to have it explained that way to folks. So so thank you for that. Um, well, Jay and I sat for you know, several hours, you know, and, you know, we've, we've gotten to know each other really, really well because he's in Oregon. And so we always run into each other. He actually came out to my hometown. Um, we we're having a conference there in eastern Oregon. But, you know, but it was that that def, that explanation took a while to get to, you know, it was very 30,000 foot level. But I had to understand it because Jay is extremely smart um, and he's pretty good at explaining things. But it's, I had to explain it to some of our members, you know, in more layman's terms. So um, it took sort of it, that, it took a while to get there. <laughs> so. Um, That's sort of the, the claim to fame is how on earth am I going to take all of this complexity and deliver it in a way that someone who hasn't spent so much time trying to understand the complexities can understand it in one seminar. And yeah, that's, you know, and, and as yeah, chairman of the board, cool. as chairman of the board of the NIHC, I'm sure you're doing plenty of that, brother, <laughs> we are. We are. Sure. in a big way. Attention hemp farmers, introducing Advanced Hemp, the world's first hemp-specific fertilizing system designed to maximize yield and CBD production. Advanced Hemp's team of 25 PhD plant scientists have been researching the plant for over 20 years and understand it better than anyone. Don't fail to meet your hemp's unique needs like far too many farmers did last year. For heavy yield of the high CBD hemp, feed your crop Advanced Hemp. And you can order online at advancedhemp.com. That's advancedhemp.com. But don't wait, because production is limited. So pre-order now. No, going back to the, the checkoff program for a minute. Um, when, yeah, again, you, you ask the question, you don't, you already know the answer, but you're aware of, of what would seem like, even though it's an illogical question when you actually know the answer, but it's a, log a logical question for folks saying, you know, why, why am I helping my competitor? Um, and, and as I sort of tee up this question for you, you know, Bob Hoban is one of my favorite, first of all, he's one of my favorite humans and advocates, but certainly one of my favorite lawyers. I was raised by one, so I, I happen to have a great affinity for lawyers and have worked with them most of my adult life. And he coined the term coopetition, which hemp, hemp is not only delivering on uh, so much of a, of a promise if we can steward this crop correctly in terms of being able to build soil um be such a healer for the biosphere and the planet and also serve all of these needs of humanity um but it also lends itself to a cooperative business model hemp is simply the crop to bring us all together and understand that working smarter not harder Harder is the way to go. And, and a good example of that, it, that folks just, I think it, it passes them by, even though it's so in their face, particularly if you know anything about New York City, a fashion district, a diamond district, right. a meat district. Sure. So let's talk a little bit more about why it is and why it's natural. It's interesting in all forms of cannabis, there there's, tends to be this aversion, whereas all the other industries get it, whether it's a magazine industry, whether it's the widget industry, they understand that they're stronger together. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, I find that interesting. I think, I'm not sure if I, if I would agree with that wholeheartedly. I would say, I think Farmers, the vast majority of farmers want to work together. I think it's the industry, um, not the industry, but, you know, as it works, it's only been legal for 
four years now. And the background, though, it's 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 like um, prohibition. Well, six right? in terms of 2014, where it's but for six in the big scheme yeah, of things, very well, new, I mean, very new. Research. Well, I mean, for for I mean, yeah, six years, but that's research and anyway. But anyway, um, yes, but I but I think it's the background of the industry is if you're in hemp more than six years ago, you're probably on the illegal side of things, right? And so that's a certain characteristic of a person who would be in that, in that, I wouldn't say industry, but in that space, right? Um, well, uh, well, for what it's worth, and just, just so, you know, so many of us have been leaders. I mean, hemp traders has been the number one purveyor, right, of hemp textiles and, and fiber for 25 years. And all I've ever sold was seeds and oil. But I absolutely understand what you are saying when we get these these interesting resumes from people who talk about all of their experience cultivating. And you're like, what the heck were you cultivating before 2014? Continue. Right. <laughs> right, right, right. You know, and so you know, so I mean, it's a it's a certain personality type of you know of our of our forefathers of folks who would go out you know go out west and you you know you're you you'd hop in a in a wagon and you know you you got no idea what's waiting for you but you're gonna go you know so they're very entrepreneur spirit you know absolutely um you know and, and wonderful people and you know but it's just but it's also who you trust so you you know you're you know, so you build kind of a your 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 tribe, so to speak. Um, you know, of who you of who you trust and who you work with. Um, you know, and that's also regional. It's not going to be if somebody's growing, you know, hemp or cannabis or um, in Oregon that they're necessarily going to know somebody in Kentucky, right? Um, so I think that's kind of you know, there's that kind of in the background, but I do think that people get it. And, you know, we had our meeting in Portland and, um, and I think that was kind of a transition phase for many folks who, you know, it was, Oh, these guys are the suit and ties. And it was kind of a, a bit of a derogatory term, you know, and then they came to our meeting and understood, Oh, they're the suit and ties. And this is for, you know, whether you liked it or not is the direction that the industry is going and needs to go. Um, you know, so you can be craft brewing in your, you know, garage and you love it and you have your friends and you might grow. You might be a Ben and Jerry's ice cream that grows and, you know, becomes a, a multi-million, you know, dollar company. Um, but, you know, the your friends who are churning, you know, butter and ice cream, you know, at home, you know, they're, that's not the direction of where the industry is going, you know, for good or bad, however, however you want to see it. So, I mean, a long-winded answer to your question Yes, yeah, there is, but we're all kind of in the same boat together. And I think the argument is, um, you know, if you want this to succeed and not become ostrich meat and, um, you know, llama wool, you know, which, and there isn't, there's a market for that. Don't get me wrong. Um, but it's not mainstream. And hemp really can be mainstream. It has obstacles to get over, as you know, Joy, of, you know, just people look at it. even our meeting in Portland, Oregon. It was, well, we were kind of wondering, it was hemp, but like hemp is legal, uh, you know, and they were thinking, you know, it was something else. And so those are the hurdles that we can overcome, you know, with the checkoff program. And just to let people know is there's still barriers out there. You know, we have a governor in South Dakota that's, you know, not really happy with, you know, the the, the, the product, right? Um, so I guess that's, you know, again, you know, long answer to your short question. No. Of no. Oh, are you kidding me? We love the long winded answers and it, to get the benefit of, of your thinking and all of that. It's, it's very, very helpful. Um, incredibly help, helpful, in fact, uh, to, to the listeners. And, and so that as we all can just really get our, our head around the emergence of a crop that feeds all of these needs. I mean, uh, delivering on this promise is just, is just, it's my purpose. It, it is, it consumes me. It consumes me, Patrick. And to have folks like you involved, you know, once the 2018 farm bill happened, you know, that's it. Gloves are off. We, we need the big guns here to take it all the way home. So really just can't thank you for taking that passion um, that you were inspired by so many decades ago um, and running with it. 
And was it was it you essentially whose idea was it to the extent you could disclose um, to form the NIHC? Is this something that you had been thinking about and dreaming about, speaking with some colleagues? Did someone recruit you, or how did that happen? Oh well, no, it was you know like like hemp and other things. It was just organic. Um, it was you know like I said, we had our family farm. We're down to uh, you know we're down to you know a couple hundred acres. Um, you know, from, a you know, uh, you know, my father had passed away and the corporate side of the farm was sold. And so, I mean, excuse me, the, the personal side was sold and so we had the corporate, but what are you going to do with, you know, uh, you know, that kind of acreage in, in Oregon, which is basically a garden. Um, so obviously like with everybody else, it's like, oh, you started seeing the numbers, $18,000 an acre, $2,000 input. And, um, you know, 100 acres, 200 acres. It's like, oh, those are some real numbers. Um, and so a lot of our folks in my area were looking at it. Uh, my cousin actually works at a CBD processing facility. Um, so, you know, we, there's already a lot of information, which is gathering information. Um, and folks in the area were just, you know, asking questions. And I thought, this is an association, right? You're just, you know, it's networking and, and providing information and sharing information. Um, so, you know, talking with fellow farmers and, you know, uh, folks in the area, you know, we got together and said, you know, you want, you might as well just create an association because that's what you're doing. Um, and that's really how it formed. And, you know, we had investors, you know, put in to get it started and, you know, here we are. And, um, it's been a, it's been a wonderful ride and very interesting. Uh, so that's kind of how it all happened. What a bonus for hemp that you were bit by its bug. That is just fantastic. And and one more thing on the checkoff program um, as we come to a close, because it is, it's just so important to the industry. And, and the fact that NIHC is is really taking the lead on that and, and being like, we're, we're going to do this. I The gratitude is really words don't actually express. Can we talk a little bit about checkoff funds being used for research and that advancing the industries? Yeah, absolutely. Um, checkoff programs can be used for, you know, education, advancing the industry. Um, there's a lot of research to be done. You know, again, you know, talking about, you know, we talk about, you know, uh, with Noller and, um, you know, those folks, is that research is being done. And how that normally happens is, you know, it's kind of like people invest in it or just put the hours in and hope to get paid. There, you know, if we can show the industry can show, you know, that we need to do the, that research in the United States, right? It's it's been done in other countries, but they're just not recognized, uh, you know, as as qualified to do it, even though it's good research. So that needs to be done in the U.S. and you know, Oregon State, and and you know, you you you've been in those at Oregon State University and, and other areas are very well qualified, you know, to do that. The Oregon Health Science University. Um, really, you know, top notch. Cornell, you, you know, obviously, Cornell is quite yeah, a leader. Yeah. You know, you can, Colorado you can, State Cornell, University. But I should know better. My niece is at Cornell, so I, I should know better. But yeah, Cornell's wonderful. It would be a, it would be a fantastic place. Um, you know, to do the research. They are. I mean, Larry Smart and Jay Noller, they're they're just two peas in a pod. Two peas in a pod. Yeah, they are very much so. Very, very great people. And you know, again, Jay's in it. You know, because of the love of of the industry and. Uh, of, of of the crop, you know, very much so. And he's, I just love him to death. And, but yeah, that could, you know, it could actually be used for that, um, again, for promotion, but also, you know, we're looking at other programs at USDA, you know, that can be done, you know, used for research. Um, again, not just, you know, on the, on the CBD front, but, you know, other areas, um, not necessarily research per se, but, you know, textiles, you know, hemp is, you know, it's a very sturdy fiber, but, you know, on the front end, yes, it's very, um, you know, uh, environmental and, you know, low energy, low water use, you know, but on, as you know, on the back end, it requires a little bit more energy intensive work to get it pliable because it's, you know, it's just like one step below the strength of steel. Um, so it's great, you know, for stability, but, you know, to make it into fabric, um, really, you know, for stability. But, we talk you know, about it all the time. So. We, as we always yeah. say, we love that it's the longest, strongest fiber in the world after it's harvested and processed. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Absolutely. So, yeah, no, the, the checkoff program we use for, you know, um, you know, a lot of things, um, you know, but, you know, it, it's research and promotion, you know, programs, um, you know, as, as we talked about. But again, I just really want to emphasize it's not any one organization. NIHC can't do it by itself. It's just the program's not built that way. It takes everybody you know, all organizations. So, you know, U.S. Hemp Roundtable, 
vote hemp, you know, um, NIHC, et cetera. It's going to take all organizations, you know, to go, yeah, all of us to work together. And, you know, I mean, I, I understand, you know, how things are, you know, and, and, you know, backgrounds and that type of thing, but, you know, this is for the good of the order. Um, you know, so that's the only thing I can say is just, you know, that, that this is for the good of the order. Um, you know, it's bigger than all of us and, you know, really is a key piece uh, to making hemp really mainstream. And I think, you know, if, if your messaging it's like, you know, we need to make hemp mainstream um, so it doesn't go the way of, you know, a buffalo meat or something to that effect where, you know, there's there's a niche market for it. But this could really be a, a mainstream market. Right. I mean, in terms of like cotton, some places we're not even competing with cotton. You know, they talk about, oh, you're competing with cotton. But California, cotton's pretty much left uh, the state because it's too water intensive, you know, where hemp would be a wonderful, wonderful product. Uh, crop to be grown. Uh, Absolutely. And and don't get me started on the bow weevil and the fact that the cotton crop right. takes up over 50% of the world's use of pesticides every year only to produce for us an inferior short fiber. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to be careful. My cotton friends might get on me, but I, I hear what you're saying. And it, and it's oh, you're okay. totally right. And, I, and I apologize I for that. It. You know, I, I have a so you're okay. don't, no, no apologies necessary. Not at all. Um, that's why you're all, you're so awesome because you're you're out there on the front and fighting, and it's, and I just really enjoyed, you know, working with you in the short time we've known each other. It's just, it's really, it's really refreshing and nice to run into a, a true believer and advocate. Well, I can't thank you enough, and I just want you to know, particularly in in my capacity with these leadership roles, with these wonderful organizations that can support, they have the infrastructure and the funding and the function to support my aggressive agenda and all the passion that I have. And, and brother, if I can, can work with, with you to, to really get all of us together on this checkoff program, I just want you to know you can absolutely count on me. And, and uh, I'm very much looking forward to continuing this discussion. And, and in the meantime, cheering on you and the National Industrial Hemp Council at hempindustrial.com. Patrick, thank you so much for being with us today. And I'm going to look forward to having you back on. Oh, well, thank you very much. I would look forward to that. Have a healthy, healthy weekend, and we'll we'll talk with you again and and moving forward in each other's missions. It's just wonderful. And and I this John Johnson, I'm coming for John Johnson. <laughs> that sounds good. We're actually going to have a call with him next week, so um, ping me, um, and we'll get you on the call. Beautiful. Oh, I would love it. Excellent. Once again, thank you so much, Patrick, and stay healthy. Yeah, you too. Stay safe, Joe. Take care. I'm Larry Michigan. I'd like to invite you to join Jim Marty and me on our weekly podcast, The Deadhead Cannabis Show. Each week we explore the latest cannabis and jam band news and reminisce with other cannabis industry deadheads and jam band aficionados about the great musical acts that we've seen and heard. Check out a new episode every Monday at mjbulls.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. My name is Kira Reed, and I'd like to invite you to be inspired by the women who are leading in the cannabis industry. Each week, we will discuss empowerment, leadership, and what it means to be a woman in charge in marijuana, hemp, and CBD. As the founder of the Women Empowered in Cannabis community, I have had the great pleasure to get to know many brilliant and talented women who are CEOs, executives, politicians, advocates, and community leaders that are focused on creating a cannabis economy 
that is just, fair, and equal. We'll learn how these women make decisions, how they navigate a predominantly male industry, and what they're doing to level the playing field for women. I hope you'll join us.